questions on the Zoom, uh, people that have Zoomed in for us today. Uh, we'll open in a word of prayer, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what our, our plan is for tonight. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given to us your word. We thank you that you have given to us uh, this last book of the Bible that we'll be studying tonight and other parts of your word in which you have taught us uh, your plans uh, for uh, bringing to the conclusion uh, the, this, the, the story of the earth that you have begun with creation and that you are continuing to unfold uh, through history. Lord, pray that you would give us uh, understanding of your word pray that you would give me the ability to speak and teach uh, clearly and accurately. And Lord, we pray that uh, we would come to love Christ more and to anticipate his coming through the study uh, that we have tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, tonight, uh, what we'll do is we'll, be, we'll, we'll finish looking at the prologue. Uh, we began that last night, and we spent some good time in the prologue because understanding the prologue is going to give us a good understanding of how to approach the entire book. And then we're going to move uh, rather quickly through the next section, which would be uh, chapter one, verse nine, all the way through the end of chapter three. And we'll actually then move in, begin into the, the next section, chapters four and five, and we'll move fairly quickly through chapters four and five. Uh, then when we get to chapter six, it's really important to understand the Olivet Discourse in, that Jesus gave in the Gospels in order to understand chapter 6, because chapter 6 is alluding back to the Olivet Discourse. So we'll begin a study of the Olivet Discourse. I, I doubt that we'll finish that tonight. We'll probably pick up with that uh, tomorrow. I also plan, we had one break uh, last night. I, I'm thinking tonight we'll break uh, twice, 10 minute breaks, uh, right around the hour uh, break. So that would be the that would be the plan uh, for uh, for tonight. I'd like to pick up uh, where we left off last night. I'm pulling it up in my notes here in, in terms of the salutation. So if you want to look down to verses five and six. I'll just summarize a little bit of what we did uh, last night. We looked at uh, this being a revelation from Jesus Christ, uh, and it was given to John the Apostle to show his servants, to show Jesus' servants, the things that must soon take place. And we talked about how that must soon take place is actually an allusion back to Daniel chapter 2. And Daniel chapter 2 gives us a divine outline of history that stretches from Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon all the way up uh, to the end of time. Uh, Daniel actually calls them the, the end of days. Uh, here John says it soon because after the first coming of Christ, we could expect Christ to return at any time and to bring his, uh, his, uh, the ultimate manifestation of his kingdom to pass. And then we looked at, uh, at this greetings, grace to you and peace from him who is, from he who is and who was and who is to come. We talked about how that is uh, God the Father. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and that is the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. And we looked at how that prologue is actually pointing us, even in these titles of God, is actually pointing us to look towards the future. These are all titles that relate in some way uh, to God's future work on earth. And then we began to look at the doxology that is given, uh, beginning in verse 5, partway through verse 5. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his, to his God and his Father. And we noted that uh, we have here uh, the cross work of Christ, uh, he freed us from our sins by his blood. And then also, uh, it alludes all the way back to Genesis uh, 1, 26 through 28, where God intended for humanity to rule as his vice regent. And Adam failed at that. And then uh, Israel failed at that. And now under the new covenant, God intends for his church to truly reign uh, as kings and as priests to God the Father. 
Now there's what we call an already and a not yet aspect to the reign that we have or to the priestly aspect of what we have. Uh, the Puritan Thomas Manton observes that Christians, we actually still await the day when we will tread Satan under our feet. That's a language from Romans chapter 16. And furthermore, the day is still future when Christians will be sitting upon thrones with Christ and his coming, judging the world and the angels themselves. So while there's a present aspect to us being kings in Christ, and, and you can even see this uh, in past tense that John uses here in verse 6, he already has made us a kingdom and priest to God the Father. Uh, Thomas Manton is arguing that there's a future aspect to this as well. And Manton says the same thing is true of the priestly work of Christians. Manton says that um, while the Christian Christians do presently offer up sacrifices of praise to God, Hebrews 13, 15. So as we offer up sacrifices of praise to God, we're fulfilling this priestly work that God has given to us. But Thomas Manton says to fully enter into their priesthood, Christians must be sanctified and enter into God, fully into God's presence where they will offer eternal praise. And Revelation 5.10, I think, specifies that it's a future ministry, future reign and a future ministry that will take place on earth. I'll turn to that verse here quickly. Revelation 5.10 says, And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God. That's, that's the same phrase that we have here in chapter 1, but it concludes, and they shall reign on the earth. And this Future reign is fulfilled when the resurrected saints praise God and Christ and reign with him for a thousand years, Revelation 26. Uh, because Revelation, I'll turn, I'll turn over to that passage quickly here. Revelation 20, verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. So you see these, these three passages, we have a repetition here of this idea of priests being priests and of being kings, and it culminates there in the millennial reign in chapter 20, verse 6. Now back to chapter 1, Revelation chapter 1 and uh, verse 6. It says, to him, this is to, uh, to Jesus, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And I think it's significant that John continues this doxology by desiring the Son to receive glory and dominion forever and ever. God's people don't reign apart uh, from Christ. We reign because we are in Christ. And the, the, the consideration of Christ's eternal glory and dominion causes John to look ahead to the coming of Christ to reign on the earth. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. In fact, that, that comment at the end of verse 6, that uh, glory and dominion are forever and ever, that actually may be an allusion back to Daniel chapter 7, verse 14. In the Hebrew it reads, And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. In verse 7, when it says that Jesus comes with the clouds and that those who pierced him will see him and mourn him, that is actually alluding to the verse just previous to verse 13 of Daniel 7, uh, verse 14 of Daniel 7, it's Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, combined with Dan, uh, Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. So what he's done there is he put two passages together, Daniel 7, 13, and Zechariah 12, 10. Let's turn to, to Daniel 7 here uh, quickly. We'll actually, we'll actually spend some time here in Daniel chapter 7. Let's read Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. There Daniel says, I saw the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. So let me, let me scroll back up here. Actually, let me. You know, I have it right up here. Um, 
So in Revelation, it says, Behold, he comes with the clouds. And in Daniel here, it says, Behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man. The Son of Man is Christ. That was Christ's most common way to refer to himself in the gospel. So in both of these passages, we see him coming uh, with the clouds. Now in Daniel chapter 7, if you look earlier in the passage, uh, what Daniel 7 pictures is a world ruled by ferocious beasts. Human rule and rebellion to God is bestial. It is like the rule of beasts. Now in contrast to the beasts, one like the Son of Man comes. This is Jesus, and he comes to rule in submission to God. Here he is, he's coming to rule just as God intended Adam to rule. We have the human rule in contrast to the bestial rule. And in doing so, in ruling as God and actually intended Adam to do from the very beginning, Christ will restore redeemed humanity to their rightful exercise of dominion over the earth. If you look down to Daniel 7, verse 27. Verse 27 says, And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. So when Christ comes to rule, he actually comes not just to rule for himself. He does come to rule for himself, but he also comes to enable his people to rule on the earth, just as God originally intended in Genesis 1.28. John's doxology, then, in Revelation 1, 6, and 7, is looking back to the reversal of the fall and the restoration of the creation blessing of Genesis 1, 28, uh, when Christ, Christ will achieve this when he returns uh, to set up his kingdom. Now, we've been looking at several, several times, we've been looking at uh, what G.K. Beale has given as kind of an alternative, alternative way of, of, of reading these texts. And we've been interacting with Beale uh, a little bit on this. And Beale does not put Daniel chapter 7, uh, verse 13, in the future. He doesn't put Christ returning in the clouds of heaven in terms of the second coming. Uh, Beale proposes that Daniel 7, 13, which again, let's, let's look at that, to have that in our minds. I saw in the night visions, behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like the Son of Man, and he came to the Ancient of Days, was presented before him. So G.K. Beale proposes that Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, refers to the whole course of the church age. It culminates in the second coming, but it, it, uh, it, it refers to the whole church age. And I can see how Beale would reach this conclusion. For instance, Jonathan Edwards proposed that this phrase, came with the clouds of heaven, is, a, is applicable to both the Son's ascension up into heaven and where he went to receive his kingdom and sat down at the right hand of God the Father uh, and, and his last coming at the day of judgment where he returns to earth and he comes in his kingdom to establish that on the earth. And Jonathan Edwards, in order to support this view, noted that the angels told the disciples in Acts 1.11 that Jesus would return in like manner. So there's a connection between the ascension and the return. Edwards claimed that like manner included more than the sun ascending into the clouds and returning to the clouds. He says there's angels in both the ascension and in the return. Uh, he says that the saints who rose from the dead immediately after Jesus' resurrection, Matthew 27, 52 to 53, he proposes they actually ascended up into heaven with Jesus at that time. Now that's a little bit speculative because the Bible doesn't actually say that that happened at that time. And then he says the saints that accompany Jesus uh, they, you know, they ascend and then they return with him. You know, 1 Thessalonians 5 is how he's reading that. Now, again, I can understand why Jonathan Edwards and why G.K. Beale would take uh, that proposal or would make that proposal. But I think there are certain things in the context of Daniel chapter 7 that make it more likely that what Daniel is talking about is the second coming, the eschatological return of Jesus. We're going to spend a little bit of time in Daniel 7, because Daniel 7 is one of those important passages to understand. 
So this is in keeping with our methodology. We started in the book of Revelation and we're working our way through the book of Revelation. But when Revelation alludes back to another one of these really important passages, we're gonna, we're gonna spend some time in those passages uh, to try to understand them. So Daniel chapter seven, look at Daniel chapter seven, verse two. And this is gonna orient us to the vision. So Daniel declares, I saw my vision by night, Behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up uh, the great sea. So where is Daniel when he's seen this vision? He's on earth. He's actually looking at the sea, and the winds are, are stirring up the sea. So verse 9, it's later on in, 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 the, in the passage, he sees thrones placed, and the Ancient of Days taking his seat. Ancient of Days is God the Father. Now, perhaps in verse 9, the perspective shifts up to heaven. That happens sometimes in these kinds of visions, where the perspective shifts. Um, but I think the fact that thrones are actually being set up is a hint that the perspective is still on earth. So here's John, or rather Daniel. His perspective is on earth, and on earth he sees thrones that are set up on earth. There's a court of judgment that is being set up on earth. And the fact that there's multiple thrones set up probably refer not only to the enthronement of the Messiah at the right hand of Yahweh, which Psalm 110 speaks about, which Matthew uh, 26, 64 speaks about, but I think it refers also to the enthronement of the saints who reign with Christ. Look down at verse 18 in Daniel chapter 7. Verse 18 says, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever. And then look down to verse 21. As I looked, this horn made war, that would be the Antichrist, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High. And time came and the saints possessed the kingdom. And the saints actually have a judging function. So these thrones are set up and they can, they can have this function of judging. Verse 27, and the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole of heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. So again, the saints have a ruling function there. We see this also in the New Testament in Matthew 19 and Luke 22. Uh, so it's not uncommon for the Bible to speak of the saints ruling with Christ. We could say that the saints are, in a sense, even now, reigning with Christ in heaven. Ephesians 2.6 talks about us being seated in heavenly places. But I think it's more likely that these thrones that are being set up with the Ancient of Days is, is the future earthly thrones that are set up for this future earthly reign that Daniel 7 is talking about. Because it's Daniel 7, that's the immediate context. And the thrones that are set up, the saints reign from, that's future in, the, in those later verses in Daniel. In fact, verse, verses uh, 21 and 22 make it clear that these are, these are future, uh, th this is a future reign that's in view, because ver these verses state the boastful horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them until the Ancient of Days came. So they will rule with, with, uh, with the Ancient of Days, and with Christ, but before that happens, uh, the Antichrist is going to prevail over them. So I think this language implies an earthly location. In fact, the fact that war is made on the saints until the Ancient of Days comes to earth implies the timing is future, that the timing is eschatological. A Tremper Longman, one of the commentators in Daniel notes, the battle will continue until the final day. Thus, when the Son of Man comes with the clouds of heaven to the Ancient of Days, he's coming from heaven to earth. So I think Daniel's vision of the Son of Man coming with the clouds is a vision of the second coming. Now, let's go back and think about what Jonathan Edwards was saying. I, and, and I'm going to note that he was right about something. Edwards was right to note the similarities between Daniel 7 and the Ascension. It's true that when the sun ascended in the clouds, he was enthroned at the right hand of Yahweh. 
And Stephen's vision of the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God reflects a combination, it seems, of Psalm 110 and Daniel 7. Daniel 7 as a whole actually has numerous links with Psalm 2 and Psalm 110. Um, in all three of these passages, the Son of Man is enthroned over the kings of the earth, and the kings who oppose the Son of Man are crushed. In Daniel 7 and in Psalm 2, there's a blessing for those who follow the Son. However, there's a major difference between Psalm 2 and Psalm 110 together in Daniel 7. And this is a state, this is a, this is a distinction I found in a commentary by a man named Andrew Steinman. He's not a he's not even a pre-millennialist, he's a non-millennialist. But he, he discovered this, or he noted this distinction that I think is, is very significant and true. What he notes is in Daniel, the Messiah is not pictured as ruling until after the beast have their power taken away. Whereas in the Psalms, the Messiah's reign begins the process of defeating the nations. So there's, there's both a harmony between, between these passages and there's a divergence between these passages. And, and why is there? Why, why do some of the passages show Jesus reigning over the nations like as soon as he's resurrected and ascended? Why does Daniel 7 show it as something that is uh, completely future? And I think it's showing what the Bible teaches in many places, that the reign of Christ already is in place, but the fullness of the reign has not yet come. So Psalms 2 and Psalm 110 include both the already. Psalm 2, 1 through 7, Psalm 110, 1 through 4, that's about the already aspect of Christ's reign. These Psalms also talk about the not yet of Christ's reign. So for instance, in Psalm 2, the already, uh, Christ is enthroned over the nation. Psalm 110, he reigns in the midst of his enemies. What's not yet? Well, in Psalm 2, 6 and Psalm 8 through 12, there's still a chance for the nations to repent. In Psalm 2, it says, kiss the son, lest he be angry. There's still a chance for them to repent. And then the sun will come and shatter them with a rod of iron. In Psalm 110, 5 through 7, he will in the future come and shatter kings in the day of his wrath. Daniel 7 is about the not yet. Now that's, that's, where the, that's what the passage is about. It's about the not yet aspects. But some of the imagery from that not yet can actually be applied to the enthronement of Christ after his resurrection. And I think that's what God did by having Christ ascend up in a cloud, he's, he's picking up on this imagery from Daniel chapter 7. But Daniel 7 is actually about the return to earth in like manner in the cloud. So I hope that I hope that helped, I hope that was clear. Daniel 7 is about the future return of Christ, but some of the imagery from it can be used, um, can be used in um, in terms of the uh, in terms of the even the the ascension up into heaven uh, questions uh, either on zoom or in the room here I'm looking here at the zoom chat and it was already commented dr. Arnold I think anticipated me earlier by making a comment here in the chat that an earthly reign with together with Christ seems like the more natural reading of Daniel chapter 7 and uh, and the already not yet is how we would explain some of these things. So he, he was thinking ahead. Brother, uh, Brother Kenneth uh, asked where, where the rapture falls. And we actually, I, I am hoping to get to the rapture tonight. Um, in fact, we, I'm, I'm sure we'll get to the rapture tonight. Um, the rapture would occur prior to the return of Christ in the clouds of heaven uh, that Daniel chapter 7 is talking about. Uh, this passage doesn't really itself give us any reference points to the rapture, but we'll, we'll pick up on the rapture and some other, some other texts. Very good question. Other questions here in the room. Is that, did, did, that, did everybody follow that explanation of Daniel chapter 7 as a future, as a future, uh, the future return of Christ to, to reign with his people on earth? We're actually going to come back to this passage uh, when we um when we get to the Olivet Discourse, because Jesus actually alludes back to Daniel chapter 7 in the Olivet Discourse as well. 
Now the other passage, ah, Dr. Arnold said, I'm sure, when I said, I'm sure we'll get to the rapture tonight, he says, unless we are raptured. <laughs> In which case, we will certainly get to the rapture tonight. <laughs> um, very good, very good. Let's turn to Zechariah chapter 12. This is the other passage that uh, is quoted in, in uh, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 6. And it's actually Zechariah 12, verse 10. This passage is also an eschatological passage. It's a future passage. And the reason we know this is because of the repetition of the phrase, in that day, or that day. And that's a phrase that's used to indicate um, the day of the Lord. Now, sometimes that's used in the, to refer to um, past judgments of Israel that can be called day of the Lord. And sometimes it looks forward to a future uh, final judgment. Uh, two commentators, Eric and Carol Myers, they observed that after the exile, on that day, and similar phrases tend to focus on the exile because the, the historical judgments have actually taken place. And Zechariah was written after the exile, and so it's most likely that, the, that this is referring to, uh, to the end times. Uh, these, these passages, they tend to announce the final disaster and the accompanying deliverance that will happen in the world. Uh, it's going to be the ultimate resolution to the world's power and the problems in the day of the Lord. And on that eschatological day, God says in verse 10 that he will pour out on the Davidic house and on those that are in Jerusalem a spirit wrought transformation. And there's a little bit of debate here. It says, in, I'll read the verse here I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace, a pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps for his firstborn. And there's some debate there whether spirit refers to the Holy Spirit or to the change of heart. And I'm not sure that it matters that we figure out what precisely it is because if it refers to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit works that transformation of our spirit. He changes our hearts. If it refers to the change of heart, the change of our spirit, well, other passages of Scripture tell us who does that. And that's the Holy Spirit who does that. So one or the other, they're, they're, both, uh, they're both involved there. But in either case, the Spirit is poured out on the house of David and on those in Jerusalem so that when they look on Yahweh whom they have pierced, it's a striking thing. Yahweh is pierced by these people. Of course, that we now know is a reference to Jesus Christ, who is Yahweh. They are brought to mourn. In John 19, 37, actually explicitly identifies uh, this with Christ. Now, Zechariah 12, 10 is focused on Israel. But if you look back at Revelation chapter 1, and verse 7, John has universalized this. Uh, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. All the tribes of the earth refers to all the nations. Now, the mourning of Israel in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, is very clearly a mourning of repentance. And again, G.K. Beale, G.K. Beale is kind of my sparring partner in some of this. He's, he's the guy I look at and, uh, and then uh, critique a little bit. He's a, it's very helpful to have someone to, to kind of spar with. and to, to, It helps you think. It helps you think through the through the passages. It gives us another viewpoint to, to think things through about. Uh, Beale argues that Revelation transfers the referent from Israel to the nation. So in Zechariah, Israel was the one in view, but now the nations are in view. And he says that the, the mourning has to be repentance because that's what it was in Zechariah. But I think that John's universalization of those who see and mourn actually doesn't involve replacing the Jews in Zechariah 12 with the Gentiles. Because if you read Zechariah 12 carefully, both Jews and Gentiles are actually showing up in that passage. I'll look at Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 9. The Gentiles face God's judgment, quote, on that day I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. I think when the nations mourn, the mourning of the nations 
is going to be a mourning because they're being judged. Uh, Matthew 24 also alludes, Matthew 24, 30 also alludes to Zechariah 12, 10, and expands on the passage to refer to all the tribes on the earth mourning, and it seems to contrast those people that are mourning with the elect that are gathered uh, by God and his angels. So even though there are Gentiles that are converted throughout the book of Revelation during the time of tribulation, the nations as a whole don't repent. And so when Christ returns, they mourn because the judgment has come. So the doxology concludes with the return of the king to judge rebellious mankind and to establish human rule on earth under God. And then it closes with God speaking directly. He asserts that he is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. And what he purposed from the beginning, he will ensure comes to pass at the end. And then the Father's title is repeated, he who is and who was and who is to come, thus, referring, thus affirming that the self-existent, eternal God is coming. And nothing will stop his arrival on earth because he is the Almighty. So that's our prologue. Uh, any further questions? Any questions from Zoom? And any questions from uh, people in the room? I see a question here from Zoom or, or even a comment. Uh, from Brother Kenneth, he noted that, and so all Israel shall be saved, Romans 10, 11, 26. Uh, and is that what actually is also being referred to in Zechariah 12, with the Spirit of God being poured out on the people uh, in, um, in, uh, in Jerusalem and on the house of David? And, and I think, yes, that's a, good, that's a good connection. Brother Ping here may know more about that than I do at the moment, because he's been studying that, but but unless I'm corrected, uh, I, I will say that that's a very good uh, that's a very good connection to make between Romans 11:26 and and Zechariah 12:10. Uh, a very good question. Other questions or comments? Yeah. Yes. Um, do you agree with um, you know this? So I think often um, probably be led is. Um, the one that's you know, credited with um, uh, the already and not yet you know, theology. Is, is that also known as um, realized eschatology or post-importance? Inaugurated, yes. Okay. okay, so the question is, uh, George Ladd, he, he uh, really popularized this idea of already not yet eschatology or inaugurated eschatology. I actually, I think realized eschatology might be something a little different. Um, I think that's where um, maybe Dodd, and he's seen a lot more like it's like it's all here rather than already not yet. But inaugurated eschatology already not yet. Uh, yes, I do think it, it, I, it was interesting uh, reading reading up on uh, on on that. Uh, that's not original with Land. I found that it goes out actually uh, back to Gerhardus Voss. Apologies to, to those who maybe not be familiar with some of these names. These are. 20th century uh, theologians. Um, you could run that maybe in some in some directions that aren't um, that aren't helpful, but I think in general, the fact that there is an already reign of Christ and that there's a not yet a reign, yeah, I think that makes good sense of the data of, of, of scripture. Even what we're seeing in Psalm 110, where Christ is right now enthroned at the Father's right hand and he reigns in the midst of his enemies, that's a present thing. And then not yet, uh, there's a future reign where he will come and shatter kings uh, in the days, in the day of his wrath, right? Yes. So if, if, if that event um, is referring to, uh, okay, the question is, is it too late for Israel to be saved? Is that the question? Is it too late for Israel to be saved at the end when Christ comes? Yes. So if, I, if, if Zechariah 12.10 is referring to Israel being saved, then for Israel it actually is not too late. Actually, when Christ returns, there will be a mass conversion uh, of Israel uh, to, Christ, uh, to, to Christ. 
it, it, you know, it, it, it says all Israel, and, and there's a number of different ways you can understand that all. Uh, does that all refer to like every single individual that's Jewish that's alive at that time? Or does it refer to the, to the nation as a whole, there's a mass conversion? And I could see arguing either way. My, my inclination is to say it's, it's referring to the nation as a whole. The nation as a whole will finally be fully converted uh, to Christ. We will get to the 144,000. Yes. They, they are actually, um, the 144,000, they show up in, in uh, Revelation chapter 7 and Revelation uh, chapter 14. And they are converted, it seems, earlier on in, in, the, in the tribulation period. And they are evangelizing people throughout the tribulation period. Actually, one of the things the Old Testament had commissioned Israel to do is to be a light to the nations to, and to share the gospel to the nations. And there are several of those passages that are eschatological in their, in their, in their nature. These are in the, in the last days, Israel actually will fulfill its role of being a witness to the nations. And I think that's what we're seeing there in, in uh, Revelation chapter 7. And that would actually happen before the final return of Christ that uh, Revelation or that uh, Zechariah 12 is speaking of. Very, very good questions. Very good of uh, drawing together uh, ideas and, and, and having them clarified. Thank you. Uh, we have a comment here also from someone also named Ping, but he's on, I, I think this is a different, uh, different than Pastor Ping. Um, he's, he, uh, he says, now it is not as though the word of God has failed, because not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, neither are all Abraham's children, his descendants, on the contrary, your offspring traced through Isaac, Romans 9, 6 through 7. He quoted that. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, Brother Ping, uh, he, he actually has his name, his, his street name is Ping Pong. So <laughs> I, I don't know. So anyway, I don't know if you want to clarify that um, or not. It's an argue for the Israel statement. It's just the verse, so I'm not entirely sure uh, what is what is being taught here. But. Well, uh, let's keep moving. We'll move on into the into the first major part of of the book, and that is the um, that is the uh, part that begins with chapter and moves through the end of chapter three. And just before our break, we'll break here soon, but I think before our break, we can move through the rest of uh, chapter one. We're going to actually pick up the pace here. We were very slow moving through the prologue, and we went to all these other passages to get clarification, but we're going to, we're going to kind of speed forward until we get to Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. That's when we'll talk about the rapture. So we'll slow down to do that, and then we'll kind of speed forward until we get to chapter 6, and then we'll talk about the Olivet Discourse. So what we have here is John's vision of the Son of Man. John was the, he's, he's, a, he's a partner in tribulation to these people that he's writing to. He's on the island of Patmos, actually in, uh, in prison. And on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus, um, he's in the spirit on the Lord's day. And that in the spirit is what marks, that that's the phrase that marks the beginning of a new section. And he hears a loud voice like a trumpet telling him to write what he sees in the book and to send it to the seven churches. And these seven churches are named. And then he turns around and he sees the voice that was speaking to him. And when he turns around, he sees seven golden lampstands. And these lampstands actually give us temple imagery. There were lampstands in, in the temple. And here is Christ, the great high priest, standing among the lampstands. He sees in the bits of the lampstands one like the Son of Man. And here he is, Christ, the high priest, standing amidst the churches. The churches are represented by the lampstands. He's there, he's clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. And this long robe could be either priestly or kingly imagery. Uh, the temple imagery in the context of these lampstands may favor a priestly imagery, but actually, because Christ is both priest and king, really could be both of them uh, combined. 
Then in verse 14, it says, the hairs of his head were white like wool, like snow. And this white hair actually is picturing the Son of Man in the same terms as the Ancient of Days was in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13. This is thus associating Christ uh, with God the Father. And it's highlighting Christ's role as divine judge. I mean, this is a major theme throughout Revelation that Christ is coming to judge the world. It may also point to the fact that the Father, as the Father gave Christ the kingdom, he will make his followers king. Okay, he has the white hair like, like, like the Ancient of Days who gave him the kingdom. Maybe, you know, maybe this indicates he'll also give the kingdom to his Father. Is that maybe too inferential? But it's a, it's a possibility. It's a possibility that some of the commentators know. The eyes like a flame of fire uh, in uh, chapter in, uh, in end of verse 14 alludes to Daniel 10 verse 6 and it symbolizes his discernment. You know you need a judge who's able to discern between right and wrong. Here he is. He has the eyes like a flame of fire. They can discern as he judges his enemies. His glowing bronze feet point to his glory and to his purity. And I say that because um, there's allusions to Ezekiel 1.13 with the vision that Ezekiel has of God and his glory in terms of this bronze imagery. And purity shows up in the Psalms that connect with bronze, Psalm 12 and Psalm 46, even in Daniel chapter 12. The voice like a sound of many waters actually alludes to the voice of God as it's spoken of in Ezekiel 43.2. God has a voice that speaks like many waters. Here, Jesus, the Son of Man, has a voice uh, like the sound of many waters. Then it says, um, in his right hand, he holds seven stars. The right hand symbolizes authority and control. You know, like the Son, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. The right hand is the is the is the place of authority and the presence of the stars in that right hand show that they are protected by christ now the stars are interpreted in chapter 1 verse 20 as the angeloi of the seven churches now this word angeloi uh, could be translated angels and it could refer to heavenly beings you can actually hear it the greek word angeloi sounds very similar to our english word angels and so it's often uh, translated to refer to heavenly beings. However, it can also be a translated messenger, and it can refer to human messengers. And I think it would be odd for the stars to represent, angel, to, to represent angels who personify churches that are symbolically represented by lampstands. You see, there's like too much symbolism there. The stars represent angels who represent churches, which are also represented by lampstands. It's like, oh, that's piling things up uh, a little bit too much. So the, the word could be translated messenger and could uh, refer to a human messenger, and I think that's what's most likely in this context. There's a commentator uh, named Peter Lightheart, and I think his argument for these being humans is actually worth noting at length. He says, the fact that Jesus dictated uh, messenger, dictates messages for the angels uh, let me start this again. The fact that Jesus dictates messages for the angels uh, suggests that the seven messengers are human. The widespread conclusion that these are angel spirits rests on an abstract, ahistorical conception of what Jesus uh, tells John to do. Jesus actually appeared to John and dictated actual words that we read in the text and expected John to actually send the messages to the churches. Now, the notion that the recipients are angel spirits doesn't make a lot of sense. To put it provocatively, Lightheart says, where do angels receive their mail? And how does John know the address? In fact, he says, the more we try to imagine a set of letters sent to angel spirits, the more implausible it becomes. And then we are left with the unhappy and perhaps unfair suspicion that the commentators do not think that Jesus really intended John to write to angels at all. In other words, it's better to think Jesus really intended him to write these letters and send them to these angeloi. And if that's the case, it's likely that they are human uh, messengers. 
The contents of the message confirm, I think, beyond reasonable doubt that the angels are human. Um, in, we can't tell this in our English translations, but in, in the Greek, uh, most of the exhortations are explicitly addressed to a single person, to these messengers. And it, it might be difficult for us to understand um, an, a, a messenger or a human leader, the leader of a church, responsible for the condition of his flock. You say the whole flock is doing wrong. You, you, you hold this one person, we would say the pastor of the church, is I think how we would really end up understanding these messengers to be. You understand him as responsible to the whole flock. But it's even more difficult to understand an angel as, as responsible for the wrongdoing of, of a church. In fact, do angel spirits suffer spiritual lethargy? Do they have dark nights of the soul? How does an angel repent for the sins of a church? Jesus threatens to remove the lampstand, the church of Ephesus, if the angel fails to repent. And if we think of that angel as a spirit being, that leaves the future of the Ephesian church dependent not on the repentance of the community or the leader in leading the people to repent, but it leaves the church at the mercy of an angel. And, he's, and Lightheart says, this is the very sort of enslavement to principalities and powers from which Jesus delivered us from. We, we aren't dependent on whether an, an angel is doing right or wrong as to whether our lampstand, the church, is removed or not. Um, so I, I really think there's a strong argument here that these, the angeloi, are actually human, human messengers. Now, once you narrow it down to these people being human, uh, they could be either messengers sent from the church to John, to Patmos, and then they return with the messages from John. But I think more likely this refers to the primary pastor of the church. Now, some people deny this because they say churches have, have plural leadership. There's multiple pastors in churches. But act, actually, even if you believe in the plurality of leadership, that doesn't prevent one man from being the primary leader or the primary pastor. And I do think that is probably the biblical model. So I think that's what we're seeing here, These, the, the angeloi here probably the primary pastor of these churches. Then it talks about in verse, uh, end of verse 16, a sword from the mouth of Christ. And this symbolizes his judicial authority. Uh, the sword from the mouth actually combines imagery from Daniel 10 and actually from the book of Judges. And it pictures Jesus as the warrior who returns uh, to judge. So we see here in, in all of this, in, on all of this imagery, a, a real emphasis on Jesus to judge, but also on Jesus to preserve and to protect uh, his church. Well, any questions now that we've reached the end of chapter one? I do see one in, in the Zoom question that actually goes back a little ways. How are we sure that the Ancient of Days in Daniel 7 uh, refers uh, to God the Father? Um, so I'm going to turn back here to Daniel chapter 7. And, and I think the reason why some people, and I don't know if this is, if this is the reason why this question is answered, is, is the father is pictured here you know, with hair in, in, in a more anthropomorphic terms. And so some people might wonder, you know, so this is a vision, this is a symbolic vision. It's not actually like a, it's not like there's a movie camera up in heaven with this vision. Uh, you know, and this is what God the Father looks like because God the Father is a spirit who's invisible. He, he doesn't have a body. So here he is, he's just pictured in anthropomorphic terms. But the Ancient of Days is an appropriate uh, title uh, for God the Father because he's eternal. Um, the, the clothing and the, uh, that's white as snow and the hair that is like pure wool we refer both to the ancientness and to the purity of God the Father. The stream of fire that issues out and comes before him and the thousands of the thousands serving him, this is a picture of the divine throne. And that picture of the divine throne shows up in many passages, like Ezekiel, it will show up again at the end of Revelation. Uh, well, actually also in Revelation uh, chapters 4 and 5. And these thousands of angels that are serving him would also indicate that this would be God the Father. The fact, too, that the Son of Man comes to the Ancient of Days to receive his dominion also would point to this out to be God the Father because uh, Psalm 110 
tells us that it's the father who subdues the son's enemies and gives him the reign. So we put all these facts together and uh, that would um, that would tell us that, that it is uh, God the Father. Brother Kenneth also noted that because Son of Man is distinct from the, from the Ancient of Days, and the Son of Man is Christ, he's related to the, to the Ancient of Days this way, this would also show him uh, to be the Father. Very good question. A very good question. Other questions? Uh, Dr. Arnold, uh, why don't you uh, pick up, you, you mentioned there uh, Revelation uh, 4, 5, why don't you, uh, why don't you pick that up and, uh, and, and take that, expound on that thought for us. Sure, I mean, my rationale there would just be something similar parallel to the event in Daniel 7, where there's two figures and then something is given, the authority is given to the second figure. So when you go to Revelation 4 and 5, you see the one who is on the throne and then the, uh, the lamb comes before him who is worthy to open the book. So there's some kind of, it seems like there's some kind of uh, literary parallelism between the Revelation 4 or 5 progress with the Daniel 7 Ancient of Days giving authority to the Son of Man. And then if once you do that, then it's the one on the throne and the lamb. I mean, anyway, it's all through Revelation in a way that's, I think, pretty explicitly the Father and the and the Son, or the Father and the Messiah. Very good, yes. I, yeah, that's probably a, an explicit allusion there in chapter uh, 4, uh, back uh, to Daniel 7. And the Father giving, what he gives the Lamb is actually that seal scroll where all these judgments uh, come, that they come from. So very good. Any other questions? It's, we're, about, we're right at about 8 o'clock. Um, so this will be a good time for a break. So any last questions before we break? Okay, let's break and we'll reconvene at 8.10. Revelation 2 and 3, and I do intend to move through Revelation 2 and 3 uh, rather quickly. We could spend a lot of time here at these churches, this is rich, rich material. I think we'll, we'll, where we will stop in this section is um, is when we talked about the rapture in Revelation 3:10. So the first church is the Church of Ephesus. Each of these churches have a have a um, have Christ mentioned with one of the characteristics of the earlier vision in chapter one. It's one of the reasons why we know this is a cohesive section, Revelation 1:9 through the end of chapter three. In Ephesus, Christ holds the seven stars, he walks among the seven lampstands, and he commends this church for their good works, for their endurance, for their not tolerating false apostles. But he critiques them for their loss of their first love, probably of the loss both for Christ and for their brothers, both of the two great commandments. Uh, there's an emphasis for love really in all of John's writings, and it shows up here as well. And then there's a promised reward in all of these letters, and that promised reward refers to eternal life. It's a tree of life. It refers to eternal life. Eternal life is the reward for those who overcome. Smyrna, uh, the church of Smyrna, uh, Christ is the first and the last. This is the reference to Christ who was uh, also was dead and is now alive. And I think that's significant for this church because this church will have members that face martyrdom but who will actually be given the crown of life and are promised that they won't be hurt by the second death. That would be eternal death in hell. They're commended because their persecution may have led to, to, uh, to poverty. Um, these are probably people that were slandering them and persecuting them were Jews by birth, but not truly spiritually God's children. And these people are going to be tested for 10 days. There's a little bit of debate about these 10 days, and, and we might, well, I'll, I'll talk through those different options here because I think it's, it's helpful for us. First, the 10 days could just refer to a small but round number, signifying a small period of time. It could refer to a 10-day testing that Daniel chapter 1 refers to uh, in terms of the uh, Daniel and his friends were tested for 10 days, and therefore for a limited period of time. Third, it could refer to a, uh, a limited but prolonged period of persecution. 
Or some people think it refers to 10 historical periods of persecution under 10 different Roman emperors. Fifth, some think that, think that it refers to a literal 10 day period, a brief but severe outbreak of persecution occurring shortly after the epistle appeared. Sixth, some people claim that this is language of the arena, similar to inscriptions celebrating gladiatorial contests. You know, so what should we make of these things? Um, four is a little odd. 10 historical periods of persecution under 10 Roman empires, that, that's maybe taking the symbolism a little bit too symbolically, or, or you know, you're taking it as a kind of a really strange kind of symbolism. Um, I think the most likely uh, uh, interpretation is the combination of these first three. It's a small but round number, uh, signifying a complete but brief period of time. It may allude to the 10-day testing of Daniel. And uh, while limited, it's long enough to uh, allow for, seri uh, for serious persecution. Does it refer to actual 10 days? Osborne actually says that... Uh, that verse uh, five, the view five, that it's literal 10 days has to be ruled out. But, I, but if I did that, I'd have to say that, that it's a complete but brief period of time that could be nine days or 13 days, but it couldn't really be 10 days. And I don't think that's a wise thing. That seems too specific a denial. So I'm gonna say that it could possibly be literally 10 exact days, or it could just be a, a reference to the way we, we talk generally about you know, a brief period of time, like a 10 day period of time. I think it could be either, either one of those. Working through that, thinking through that gives us a sense of how we should think about uh, the, this, this kind of symbolic language in the book of Revelation. So we don't want to get too weird. You know, 10 days refers to 10 emperors that persecuted that. You know, you're a little distant from the actual imagery there, but 10 days is a, is a brief period of time. Uh, or 10 actual days. I mean, both of those are real possibilities that we should that we should entertain. What's the promised reward for Smyrna? Uh, the crown of life, which is a metaphor again for eternal life. You see, eternal life is showing up in both of these two churches as the reward for those who overcome. Uh, they are free from the second death, which is confinement in the lake of fire, eternal punishment in hell. Then we come to Pergamum. What's the characteristic of Christ in Pergamum? Well, it's Christ standing over the church as a judge because of the church's sin. Uh, and that pervades this whole entire epistle. Where, whereas there was no commendation for Smyrna, uh, there is in Pergamum. And there, in, in the commendation, there's a reference to them remaining faithful, even though Satan's throne is there. And that may be a reference to the imperial cult where people were supposed to worship the emperor. And the Christians could not do that. The critique, though, is that they ate meat sacrificed to idols and they committed idolatry. Um, so this is similar to what was given in Acts 15, is what even the Gentile Christians were not supposed to do. They were not supposed to eat meat uh, offered to idols. They were not supposed to commit adultery. Balaam is mentioned here because he was the one in the Old Testament that led the Israelites into immorality and idolatry for his own financial gain. I think it's interesting that Balaam was threatened with being killed by the sword of the angel of the Lord if he continued um, to, to uh, resist God. And, and uh, he actually was killed by the sword uh, later on, according to, uh, according to Jewish, Jewish tradition. So that's an interesting, that's an interesting uh, uh, connection there because, whoops. The, uh, the, the image of Christ here in this church is that Christ is the one who has the sharp uh, two-edged sword. The promised reward, uh, the, it was refers to hidden manna in the, in the Ark of the Covenant. The, the Ark is what, is what hid, is what held that manna. Um, I think that probably is referring to fulfillment. Uh, again, in the future, it's a symbolic fulfillment of presence, presence with God and his sustenance. Uh, the white stone with the name on it, it's very difficult to know what that means, uh, but it could be the name of the overcomer is written on that stone. Uh, many commentators know that uh, the, there was a stone that was given to victors at the games, and that was their entrance into a feast. Um, that could be. 
They have a, their name given to them as, a, as an entrance point into, into eternal life. Thyatira, uh, the characteristic of Christ is that he is the Son of God. Uh, the word of the Son of God was eyes like a flame of fire and feet like, like bronze. And he could be searching this church, showing them the need for purity. Uh, the title Son of God can be used here to provide a link with Psalm 2, which is cited explicitly at the conclusion of the letter. And so this combination of Psalm 2 and um, Daniel 7 should, uh, should, could show us the, the theme of judgment. That's the primary function of the Son of God in Psalm 2. The church is commended um, for its faith or possibly for its faithfulness. Uh, it's critiqued uh, for giving way to this lady named Jezebel. It's a symbolic name for some prominent woman in the church, perhaps a false teacher, seems to be a false teacher, who leads the community into immorality uh, and to false teachings. The promised reward is that the Messiah's followers will actually share in his rule in the future. Um, the morning star referred to as part of the promised reward probably refers to Numbers 24, 17, which is a, which is a reference to the Messiah and his reign. So this continues the idea of, the, of God's people reign with Christ. Uh, in Sardis, we have um, the, the, the one with the seven spirits of God and the seven stars in his hand is the symbol of Christ. Um, here they have the reputation uh, for being alive, but they're actually dead. And so it calls on them uh, to wake up and to be strengthened in their, in their works. If there's a few, still a few names there that haven't soiled their garments, that's the commendation. They walk with, with Christ. Uh, the one that conquers uh, will be clothed in white garments, and his name will not be blotted out of the book of life. So again, we have eternal life as part of the reward uh, for uh, the overcomer. Philadelphia, the characteristic of Christ uh, there is um, he's the true one that has the key of David who opens and no one shuts. This is a reference to Isaiah 22, 22, where the Lord demanded that Eliakim replace Shebna, the chief steward of Hezekiah's household, and he be given the key to the house of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. Now, in Isaiah, this was referring to the access to the king in his palace. And this passage may have been interpreted messianically uh, in the first century and as kind of a type of where Eliakim is a type of the exalted Christ who controls the keys of the kingdom. So in this context, Jesus is the Davidic Messiah who actually controls entrance to God's kingdom, uh, the New Jerusalem. Uh, this church is commended um, because uh, they have but a little power, but they have kept God's word. They have not denied his name. Uh, on the other hand, they face the challenge of the synagogue of Satan. People that say they are Jews, they probably are born as Jews, but they, um, but they fall short in terms, of, uh, in terms of actual following Christ. They, they turn away from now, in this church, we're going to come back to its promised reward. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth, because that's where we'll talk about the rapture. Then we come to Laodicea. The characteristic of Christ is that uh, he, is the, he is the amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Uh, here are people that uh, they're critiqued for being neither hot nor cold, uh, but are... Uh, but they're lukewarm. And there's a different theories of this. Some people say that the hot waters of Hierapolis, which is a nearby city, had medicinal effects. The cold waters of Colossae were pure and drinkable and had life-giving effects. But Laodicean was lukewarm and not very palatable. That's, that's a possibility. Um, but the traditional understanding is that you, they, were, they weren't either devoted to Christ or rejecting of Christ, but they were lukewarm. Um, those are the two op options there. Uh, the promised reward uh, for them. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I have also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. That's actually, again, the saints ruling with Christ in the future. If you notice, all these rewards tie into eternal life, the new creation, life with Christ. And all who are in the church 
would be overcomers uh, and would partake of these things. If they aren't overcomers, they would show themselves uh, to have a false profession and to not be not be Christ's own. Now, what we're trying to do here is not just exposit the book of Revelation, but this is actually, a, uh, we're studying eschatology, and we're using Revelation as a way to guide us into different passages. So uh, what this does when we look at uh, Revelation 3.10 is this, this moves us into a discussion of the rapture. And let me scroll down to my notes. I have that in a different part of my notes. And so I'll move down to that section. <coughs> Here and we'll have a discussion here on the rapture. Any as I move there, any any thoughts on what we just talked about with the churches? Any questions related to the seven churches? Yes. The Nicolaitans. They were false teachers, and and exactly who they were or what they were teaching, uh, we really don't know for certain. But they were some kind of false teacher that, uh, that was leading the people astray. Nicholas, one of the seven deacons. Um, not that I know off the top of my head. Right. Uh, Brother Kenneth asks, would I use the Church Fathers as a guide to interpret the Nicolaitans? Um, they were closer to that, uh, to that time period. Uh, so that, you know, that's possible. But on the other hand, they are, you know, maybe a hundred, a hundred or so years or several hundred years removed. Um, I, I would have to look into that. I would have to look into that more. Wow. Good questions. Good questions. Yeah, and Dr. Arnold com commented, if he remembers right, it's, in, it's inconclusive that even the fathers didn't agree. That's, that's helpful. I'd have to look back at my notes to see what, the, uh, what all the survey of, of viewpoints on that would be. Well, let's jump into the rapture here. The time of the rapture is a complicated subject because the interpreter's conclusions actually depend on interlocking assumptions. You know, there's certain passages where you can go to and, and you just read the passage and as you unfold the passage, you say, okay, this is what this passage is, is teaching. And if there's disagreement or debate about a passage, it's about just how do you interpret the words of this passage? But the, the rapture is a little different. Um, the rapture, you're having to take different parts of scripture and you're having to connect them together. And your viewpoint is going to be on how you fit all of these pieces together. So I'd like us to look at a number of these passages. I'll just allude to some first. Uh, Luke 17, 26 to 37, and Matthew 24, 37 to 42. We're going to come back to this. We studied the Olivet Discourse. But I'll just note here that these passages talk about the day of the Lord, or the coming of Christ, as being unexpected when it begins. Yes, Luke 17, 26 to 37. And Matthew 24, 37 to 42. And again, we'll give more attention to this when we work through the Olivet Discourse. But the main point here is that, um, is that these are, this is going to be an unexpected uh, event. Everyone's going about their normal activities until the flood comes to sweep them away. It, oh, Jesus said it's going to be like the time of the flood, where everyone's going around their normal activities. Then the flood comes and he sweeps everybody, everybody away, surprisingly. So also the day of the Lord will come unexpectedly. Now I'll stop here and explain a little bit about the day of the Lord. Uh, the day of the Lord is an Old Testament phrase that's used again and again. And it referred to a time when God would come and bring judgment on the nations initially. With, uh, in fact, it first shows up really in the book of Joel. It talks about the judgment of God coming on the nations. And Amos the people say, oh, we look, we're looking forward to the day of the Lord. And God says, no, 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 you're a rebellious people. You shouldn't look forward to the day of the Lord because if you're a rebellious people as Israelites, you're going to get judged as well. Uh, now, the day of the Lord continues on into a period of blessing that follows the judgment. 
Now, day of the Lord can refer to uh, individual times of judgment in Israel's history. When Israel is conquered by enemies or taken into exile, these are days of the Lord for Israel. But even these point forward to a future day of the Lord, and even the prophets are recognizing there's a future final uh, day of the Lord. When we talk about the coming of Christ as well, there's a, the Greek word for that is parousia. That coming of Christ, we often think of Christ coming in heaven down to earth. It's like the last event. But that coming is actually a complex event that covers this whole day of the Lord period. You can think of the Lord coming in judgment before he actually comes from heaven to earth. He's coming in judgment. So the coming of Christ can refer not just to like a single day, but actually to a multi-year unfolding process of events. And if you think about the day of the Lord and the coming of Christ, Jesus speaks about an unexpected commencement or beginning of the day of the Lord. During the day of the Lord, normal life is not, uh, is, is, is not taking place. During the day of the Lord, everybody recognizes they're under judgment. And so you think about the, the actual physical coming of Christ in the clouds down to earth, that would never be a surprise because it's preceded by this day of the Lord. Uh, so when it talks about the unexpected coming of the Lord, it has to be the beginning of this process, the beginning of, the, of this complex event of the coming, or the beginning of this complex event of the day of the Lord. Day doesn't necessarily mean a 24-hour period. Day is like a, a time, we, we often use the time period. Oh, this was a day of sorrow, or this was a day of, and we could use the word day to refer to a, a period, a period of time. And that's what's going on here with day of the Lord. So I think on this understanding, it makes most sense for those. Uh, let me actually turn to that passage and read it. I'll read it in Luke uh, 17, 26. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given a marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and so forth. Uh, down to, so it will be on the day the Son of Man is revealed, on that day with the one who is on the housetop with his goods, and the house not come down to take them away, likewise let the one who is in the field not turn back. I tell you, in that night there will be two in the bed, and one will be taken, the other left. There will be two women grinding, like grinding wheat. One will be taken, the other left. Um, there's debate even among like dispensational interpreters about who's taken and who's left. But I think the unexpected nature of this, it makes sense for those that remain are those who remain through judgment. Well, those who are taken are the ones that are taken away from judgment. And now you might say, I don't see that in that particular passage, but we're going to have to, like I said, these passages are going to have to like interlock with one another. So we're going to have to look at a couple more passages for this to, to continue to make sense. Now, the key passage, this is one we should turn to, is 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, 13 to 17. This is the major uh, passage on the rapture. And I'll actually, I'll actually read this one. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do. We have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be at the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So this is the actual passage about saints being caught up into the air to meet the Lord. That's what we mean by rapture, the saints being caught up uh, to, to meet the Lord. Now, this passage on its own arguably reveals nothing about the time of the tribulation in relation to the rapture. You know, it just talks about them being caught up. And, and notice even the difficulty of stating the question without bringing in some understanding of other passages to bear. I'm bringing into my understanding from other passages that there is a time of tribulation. And, that the, and, and I'm trying to figure out how this passage 
uh, would relate to it. So the timing of the rapture has to be discerned by relating 1 Thessalonians 4 to other passages of Scripture. And, and there's two major views here. There's a post-tribulation view and there's a pre-tribulation view. There's, there's other variants, but those are the two major views. So those are the ones that we're going to look at. And post-tribulationalists have uh, two major arguments that they make in favor of their view. One's internal to the passage and one is external. First, post-tribulationalists argue that there's a certain term here. It's the Greek word aponetesis, which is used to indicate meaning to go out to, to meet a dignitary and to lead him back uh, to the city. And I'm going to look here, see if I can pick that word out in my English translation here. It's, it's the word meet in verse 17. Caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So a post tribulationist will look at that word and they'll say this word is a technical term. It just doesn't mean meet the Lord in the air. It means to send a delegation out and lead someone back into the city. And they say this points to a rapture in which the saints are caught up into heaven. They meet the Lord and then they return to earth. Uh, with Christ, after having been caught up to meet him, they return to him and they bring him back uh, to, the, to the earth. They're, they're a delegation to meet a dignitary and to bring him back into their city. Although it should be noted that some commentators, some of these commentators, Beal again and a man named Wima, uh, they actually take the clouds and the snatching up to be just imagery. So they actually don't think, in, the, in their rapture, nobody moves. <laughs> you know, it's just, uh, just imagery. Um, now, this claim that this word is a technical term was argued in a, in a famous dictionary called TDNT, Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. The author of the article on this word here made this claim. And a lot of the commentaries have picked up on this claim. If you pick up a commentary in 1 Thessalonians, very likely you'll hear the claim made that this word means to go out and meet a dignitary and lead him back. But actually, there's been some critiques of this dictionary. There was a man named James Barr and he critiqued the methodology of this dictionary. Uh, and he said they often, the writers of this, they often found technical terms where they weren't really uh, technical terms. Uh, this term can be used to refer to going out and meeting a dignitary and bringing it back, but that's not like what the word means. It can be used to indicate that, but that's not necessarily what the word means. So there was a later dictionary, the Evangelical Dictionary of the New Testament, and it says the evidence that TDNT gives is not so much proof for a technical term as for the ex existence and form of an ancient custom. Whether that ancient custom is in view in a particular text depends not on the presence of the term, but on the exegesis of the respective contexts. And I think that's important. You can't just say, oh, this term is here. So therefore, the rapture has to be coming up and immediately coming back down. A delegation going out to meet someone and immediately bring it back. You actually still have to do the exegesis to figure out, does this term mean this in this context? And in this case, we don't see a delegation of people going out to meet Christ. All of those who are in Christ are caught up in the air to meet Christ. Nor do they actually go out to meet him and to bring him back. They actually are caught up to meet him. So I don't think the exegesis actually favors uh, the post-tribulational understanding of the term. Now, the other argument that post-tribulationalists give is a little more impressive. And it is that there are parallels that exist between Matthew 24 and 1 Thessalonians 4. Now, in the pre-tribulational view, Matthew 24 is during, dealing primarily with the second coming proper, with the actual return of Jesus to earth. Whereas 1 Thessalonians we'll be dealing with a rapture that would happen earlier. So if the post-tribulational perspective is able to say, actually, these two things are the same event, that would undermine the pre-tribulational view. Now, G.K. Beale, he lists the following parallels in his commentary on the Thessalonian epistle. These are the parallels he sees before, but between uh, these two passages. One, Christ returns. Two, from heaven. Three, accompanied by angels. Four, with the trumpet of God, five, believers are gathered to Christ, six, 
in clouds. And I'll repeat that again. These are the parallels he sees. One, Christ returns. Two, from heaven. Three, accompanied by angels. Four, with the trumpet of God. Five, believers are gathered to Christ. Six, they're gathered in clouds. Now, I think these parallels, as you start to probe them, end up not being quite as impressive as it would first appear. You would think, oh, six parallels. You know, that's a lot of parallels between these two passages. But points one, two, and six would be in the nature of the case, the same, whether you have the, you know, whether you have the, the events distinguished or not. So one, Christ returns. Well, if it's a rapture or if it's the second coming, you know, both of those are going to, in the nature of the case, be true. Two, from heaven. Well, again, in the nature of the case, that's going to be true, whether it's a, a distinct event or the same event. Um, and six, in the clouds. You know, again, that kind of similarity is going to be true in the nature of the case. Point four is a more exact point of comparison, a trumpet of God. But if one sees for other reasons these events are, are distinct, there's nothing to prevent a trumpet happening at both, both places. Three, accompanied by angels, with regard to the point three, Thessalonians actually doesn't say that the angels accompany Christ. It does say there's a voice of an archangel, but it doesn't actually say the angels accompany Christ. That's only mentioned in Matthew. And with regard to point five, in Thessalonians, the saints are caught up to meet Christ in the air. In Matthews, the angels are sent out to, uh, to, to collect the elect from the four winds. And it's unclear whether collecting them from the four winds is referring to catching them up into heaven or whether it's a, a gathering on earth. Of course, Vima and Beale would say it doesn't matter because everything's figurative. But these differences are harmonizable. The, the two things I just mentioned, you know, the catching the, elect, uh, catching the people up or you know, gathering the elect from the ends of the earth. Um, whether the archangel's voice is sounded or angels, these are harmonizable differences, but I think we should note they actually are differences rather than similarities. So I, I just, we just need to be clear there. I do think that all things being equal, the parallels between Matthew 24 and 1 Thessalonians 4 would lead interpreters to identify these two events if there weren't any other considerations. But I actually do think other considerations come into play. When these other considerations come into play, then I think the, different, the differences between the passages take on more significance. In any event, the similarities are not so compelling that we have to say we must take these two things as the same event. They're not of, they're not of that nature. Now, there are several considerations that lead me to conclude that 1 Thessalonians 4 and Matthew 24 are actually distinct parts of this complex event that we can call the second coming, with the rapture marking the beginning of that event and the second coming proper, the return of Christ to earth, march, marking the conclusion of that event. First, I think the Olivet Discourse subtly distinguishes the rapture and the second coming. And I think it does that by talking about the coming of Christ unexpectedly. And the second coming of Christ can't come unexpectedly unless, you know, that begin, there's something at the beginning there that you're talking about, not the actual return at the very end. That can't come unexpectedly because the day of the Lord is going to precede that. And the Olivet Discourse makes that uh, very, very clear. And we'll discuss more of that when we discuss the Olivet Discourse. The second argument in favor of a pre-tribulation reading of 1 Thessalonians 4 relates to what Thessalonians itself says about wrath and the day of the Lord. In the context of the day of the Lord, which is the day of wrath, 1 Thessalonians 5.9 says this. And you, if you're in 1 Thessalonians, you can look down this. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, given the context, I think it's more likely that this wrath occur, refers to the day of the Lord. That's the whole thing that is being discussed in the context, rather than merely the hell. It could include hell, but a post-tribulational stuff to say we're not destined to wrath only means that we're not destined to hell. But in the context, 
he's actually talking about the day of the Lord. So I think it's more likely that he's talking about we're not destined for that wrath. Uh, it includes we're not destined to hell, but, but it's more than that. And then the third argument, which I think is the most compelling argument for uh, the pre-tribulational reading of 1 Thessalonians 4, is the lack of harmony between the sequence given in 1 Thessalonians 4 and the sequence given in Revelation 19 and 20. Now, the sequence of events in 1 Thessalonians 4 is significant. It's actually at the heart of the argument that Paul is making in 1 Thessalonians 4. In other words, Paul is making a point out of the sequence of events in 1 Thessalonians 4. Um, the, and, and the wrath, I should clarify this. Brother Kenneth uh, mentioned this on the Zoom chat here. I should mention the wrath that we are spared from in terms of the day of the Lord is tribulation wrath. So day of the Lord and tribulation, I would equate those periods uh, together. So the sequence of events in 1 Thessalonians 4 is significant. Paul's making a point about this sequence of events. There's, there's this uh, commentator on uh, 1 Thessalonians, and he notes that the need for the instruction about the rapture comes came from the Thessalonians' concern that fellow believers who had already died would be at some kind of disadvantage at the second coming. And that, this is the concern that is indicated by Paul's emphasis that the living will not perceive the dead at the second coming. The dead will rise first. They will be raised from the, they will be raised from the dead first. Then the living and the resurrection, resurrected dead will together be caught up to meet Christ in the air. Now, some people argue, well, this is an unreasonable concern. You know, why are people so concerned about such a minor detail like that? And Wheeler says this underestimates the great anticipation and hope that the Thessalonians have about participating in the glory of the second coming. You know, the dead are, they're already in the grave, and the, the living, they're going to be caught up in, in this glorious second coming, and the dead, what happens to them? You know, maybe they'll be, it'll happen to them later. They'll miss out on the second coming. We really shouldn't underestimate the glory of participating in the second coming as Christians. And so this is their concern. And Paul gives this sequence of, sequence of events. The dead in Christ, they're resurrected first. Then those that are alive and remain, they're caught up together with the resurrected dead to meet Christ in the air. That's the order of events. So having established that the sequence given in 1 Thessalonians 4 is significant, I think it's important to note that premillennialists have long argued that Revelation 19 through 20 gives a sequential description of future events. I'm actually, um, I actually put Revelation. On the uh, screen here. Revelation 19 and 20. And I'll even share that. I, I know you can turn to this in your Bibles, but. I'll, uh, I'll share the screen as well. Okay. So premillennialists have long argued that Revelation 19 to 20 gives a sequential description of future events. Now here's some of the complexity I noted about the uh, coming to a view of the rapture. Um, and there's a complex interaction of, of, of passages. And all millennials wouldn't accept the argument that Revelation 19 through 20 is sequential. But I'm going to presume, and I'm going to later argue for a premillennial interpretation. So we're going to assume that premillennial interpretation here. Now, the argument here is that there's a sequence that moves from Revelation 19 into Revelation 20. That's why I began with a slide here on Revelation 19:11. That begins this, this section here. And this sequence is noted uh, by the repeating phrase, and I saw, or then I saw, that extends from 1911 all the way through 21.1. It gets repeated in 1911, 1917, 1919, 21, 24, 2011, 12, uh, and 21.1. And this seems to mark a sequence of events. And that actually isn't highlighted. I must have a 
one of my highlights turned off there, but anyway, it's not highlighted on the text there, but you can see the text in the Bible. Then I, uh, then I saw. Now, if there's a sequence that runs from Revelation 19 through Revelation 20, and if that sequence doesn't harmonize with the sequence of Revel of First Thessalonians 4, then we know these are talking about two distinct events. You see the, the, the logic there? So Paul makes a big deal about the sequence of events in 1 Thessalonians 4. And it, we, have a, we have a sequence of events in Revelation 19 and 20. If these are the same events, that sequence needs to be the same. If they're distinct events, the sequence will be different. And in fact, the sequence is different. In Revelation, Jesus returns from the armies of, with the armies of heaven. He cast the beast and his prophet into the lake of fire. He chains Satan in the abyss. He sets up his throne on earth. And then he raises the saints from death. Notice when the saints are raised from the dead in Revelation chapter 20. They're raised from the dead after Christ has returned uh, to earth. In 1 Thessalonians 4, Jesus appears in the clouds, first raises the dead saints to life, catches all the saints living and resurrected into the clouds. And I think the inability to harmonize these two sequences points to these passages referring to two separate events or to two different parts of what we could call the single complex event, which unfolds over a period of years, which we call the second coming, with the rapture happening at the beginning of the coming the beginning of the tribulation, the beginning of the day of the Lord, those are all synonyms. And the second coming proper, the return of Christ to earth happening at the end. And further support of the distinction between 1 Thessalonians 4 and Revelation 20 is the indication that the only saints raised in Revelation 24 are the tribulation martyrs. So the tribulation martyrs are the ones that are, you can see that in uh, 20... Uh, verse 4, I saw the thrones and uh, seated on them were those who, whom authority were given to them. And also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or received its mark on their foreheads. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So we have, a, we have distinct people who are raised to life in the two passages. So I think this would either mean that only tribulation saints are resurrected at the time of, if we're taking a post-tribulation rapture, but the rest of the dead, including the dead in Christ, have to wait to the end of the millennium. Well, that doesn't match 1 Thessalonians 4. Or we would take the pre-tribulational view. The tribulation martyrs are the only dead in Christ that still needed resurrection in Revelation 24. Because everybody else was resurrected at the beginning of the tribulation. All the dead in Christ were raised. So who are, the, who are the dead in Christ at the end of the tribulation? Only those who are martyred during the tribulation. That's why they're the only ones that are raised at the end. So I think with this data, when we compare 1 Thessalonians 4 with Revelation 19 and 20, I think that gives us a good, strong argument for a pre-tribulational rapture. I'll stop here and ask if there are any questions. I know that was... Uh, Maybe fairly uh, fairly complex. Any questions either with Zoom or here in the room to clarify the line of reasoning there? Yes. It would be fair to say then, um, you know, first that's, you know, the, the Paul and first person as well as for was seeking to comfort those who were troubled. You know, what's going to happen to the, you know, the loved ones who have died the Lord? Um, that a post tribulational understanding of death diminishes the comfort. So the question is, would a post millennial interpretation of uh, First Thessalonians four diminish the comfort? I'm. I'm not sure that it would, but maybe spell out some more what you're thinking. What is in your mind is what would just diminish the comfort? If, you know, if, I, if I'm reading that, you know, my 
my dad, you know, leaving their loved ones, um, you know, uh, I'm grieving over them. So, you know, Paul tells me that um, they're going to be wrapped it up first, you know, so they're going to be first to be wrapped it up. Um, so, um, you know, the fact that that is what's going to happen to them, as opposed to me not knowing what's going to happen to them, whether they'll happen to them or not, um, you know, they glorify for and all that, um, you know, uh, helps me because that's what that's how Paul wants us to apply this. Or at least one of the ways you want us to apply this. Comfort one another with these words. Right, right. Um, the post millennials is still expecting that event to happen. So I, I still think he could comfort. So the difference there is just the timing. So that's that's why I'm saying I'm I mean maybe maybe there's some something there what you're thinking. Um, but at least at this point, with just the timing difference being there, I, I'm not I'm not sure that I would, okay. you know, I'm not sure that I would say that. But. Okay, very good, very good point. Um, the soul uh, goes to heaven, but the body is still in the earth. And so what is happening there is, is there's actually a resurrection body uh, that is raised. So the person is reunited with their body, and then they're caught up with the living uh, to, be, to be with Christ. Is there a good case uh, for advocating burial as opposed to the other forms of <laughs> like cremation and all that? Now you have to ask a hard, a hard question. The question was, is, is, is this evidence for uh, the, the importance of burial uh, rather, than, uh, rather than cremation? Uh, what I would say there is that burial seems to be the more, the more biblically consistent um, uh, approach. Uh, but I wouldn't want to necessarily completely bind someone's conscience to that, given that the Bible doesn't explicitly address the issue. But if you're looking at what's more, more fitting, what's more appropriate, given the biblical teaching, uh, burial would, would I would argue would be more fitting, more appropriate. You know? So um, I, I really like where the argument goes as far as the sequel. And I, anyway, it's a great argument. I'm just going to toss this out there and see how how you would react somebody who was going to push back on you to say um if you look at the old testament sequence on the first coming of christ there were you know what i mean like some of the differences in the old testament descriptions of what's going to happen are wider than i think what we've got going on here like we're looking at some i don't know anyway they would, they might argue, what are some of the wider dis uh, discrepancies what do you have in mind there Oh, I thought you would ask that probably. Um, you know, what, you, get the <laughs> you get the impression at places that you're looking at the suffering suffering servant, but then it'll go immediately like, oh, uh, let's say Psalm 22 or something. You go directly from his suffering right into his victory. Um, so like, I never would have guessed the 2,000 years. In the um, maybe let's say like Isaiah 65 versus what I when I think about eternal state or millennium, and I never would have picked out millennium versus eternal state based on Isaiah 65. There's some things like that, you know? Um, I'm just, what I'm curious to see is how you would react to somebody who made that argument. I, I don't necessarily, uh, yeah, anyway, how you would react to that. Yeah, I actually think that supports my argument um, I, on, a number of, on a number of levels. Uh, one is, that it, what you're pointing out in the Old Testament is that diverse events are kind of merged into one. And I think that's what people, what post millennialists want to do is they want to merge these events into one. And what actually happened when they were fulfilled is all oh, these events is actually more complex than we initially would have thought. And I, that's what I'm saying about the second coming. The second coming is more complex than the uh, post millennialist uh, wants to give credit to. And then I also think the argument stands that. Um, that the sequence of events is actually, Paul actually gives us a sequence of events. It says this sequence is important. And then we get a sequence of events in Revelation 19 and 20, and it's an actual sequence of events. And both these sequences are important. They're given to us, but they, are, they don't harmonize unless they say they're, they're two different events or the beginning and the ending of a, what we could call a complex event. 
Uh, Joyce Young wanted to know if uh, Matthew 24 is referring to the tribulation period. And the short answer to that is yes. The long answer to that we will uh, discuss after our break. Uh, I think now is a good time to break. We actually will come back and discuss Revelation 3.10, uh, which is also about the rapture. Uh, but Lord willing, we will get to uh, the Olivet Discourse uh, today. Uh, let's meet back at 9.10. in verse 10. Revelation 3 and verse 10. And this will be the last passage we look at in regards to the rapture. This is to the church of the Thessalonians. And this is the promise to them. Because you have kept my word about the patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. So in Revelation 3.10, Christ promises that he will keep the church from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world. Now, pre-tribulationalists argue that this uh, phrase, uh, uh, which in English is translated, keep you from, indicates that Christ will remove the church uh, from the tribulation period. Post-tribulationalists, on, on the other hand, argue that Tereo Ek, uh, keep from, indicates that he will protect the church during the tribulation. Uh, Douglas Moo is a post-tribulationalist. He spends about five pages arguing in an essay he wrote on the post-tribulation rapture, arguing that nowhere else does Ek indicate a physical or spatial separation. And at the end of those five pages, he concedes that uh, even if Act never clearly denotes physical outside position in the New Testament, the issue is not conclusively settled. Because the general idea of separation from could demand a physical separation if a given context actually demands it. And I would argue that this given context actually does demand the idea of a physical separation when it refers to kept from. And the reason for that is what, what are the people promised that they will be kept from? They will be kept from the hour of trial. And that's a time period. And I don't understand how somebody can be kept from a time period if they live through that time period. Um, based on John 12, 27, Lou argues that the stress lies not on the time period at such, but on the aspect of the essential character of the situation. So John 12, 27 says, this is Jesus praying, now my soul is troubled and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I have come. Uh, to this hour. I don't think this is an exact parallel, though, because the tribulation will occur as a time period, and there's no reason to deny its normal significance, the normal significance of hour. Uh, and e even in this case, uh, Christ wasn't saved from that hour. Uh, he was called to go through uh, that hour. So I think Revelation uh, 3 10 is probably the strongest passage in support of a pre-tribulational uh, perspective. It promises that the church will be kept uh, from the coming time of tribulation. And I think it's significant as we look through uh, Revelation 3.10, it says, uh, this is the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world. So that's what the rest of the book is actually about, the hour of trial that's going to come on the whole world. And it's going to come and try those who dwell on the earth. That, those who dwell on the earth is a repeated phrase throughout the book. And so we know, okay, the earth dwellers, the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world, that's what the rest of the book is going to be about. That's this day of the Lord period. That's this tribulation period. And it's that that God promises that he will uh, save the church from. Now, some people might say, well, this is a specific promise given to the church at uh, Philadelphia. 
But the fact of the matter is, is all of these promise, specific promises that are given to the church, you'll receive the tree of life, you'll receive the crown of life, you'll receive, these are all things that all Christians are actually promised. So I don't think that uh, counts against uh, the argument here. Uh, that, that actually wraps up my thoughts on the, on the tribulation. Any, any questions about Revelation 3.10 or about the tribulation uh, in general? Rapture, I would say, would fall right before the tribulation. Yes. I am not seeing anything in Zoom. Oh, okay. We have uh, we have from Dr. Arnold. He says the most persuasive thing for him is the whole argument that the uh, coming of Christ. Um, Maybe Dr. Arnold, can you uh, can you just speak out and uh, explain that? Because I'm I'm not following exactly what you're saying in writing. Sorry. So just so like uh, pre pre trip versus post trip, and then just how to understand this pieces and stuff. I guess most persuasive for me is if there's anything the New Testament hammers about the rapture, or let's say about the return of Christ um, in some of these passages, the unknownness of it. You won't know the day or the hour, um, and so that particular piece of it, there has to be whether you want to divide out the comings and there's two different comings after and before, which is what we would do. Um, there has to be at least some sense in which his coming is unknown. Whereas if it's at the end of seven years, you can just count the clock down. Um, to me, that's really a, a pretty convincing argument. Do you find that convincing or? Yes, I do. We're actually going to move on to the uh, Olivet Discourse very soon. And when we get into the Olivet Discourse, one of the one of the things that everybody in the Olivet Discourse struggles with is the repeated saying of Jesus that nobody knows the day or the hour, and the fact that there's all these events that Jesus talks about are going to happen before Jesus actually returns. And how do you make sense of that? And again, I, the only way I know to make sense of that is to say the coming of Christ is a complex event, and that coming. Uh, begins completely unknown. And throughout the coming, throughout this whole complex of event of Christ coming in judgment, there's all these things that, that we do know will happen, and then he finally returns to earth. Now, you could hold that as a post-tribulationalist and say, okay, yeah, the coming is a big complex event, but the rapture still happens at the end. Um, but I think it makes a lot of sense to say, okay, this whole thing is called a coming. Why don't we have a coming that is... Um, the coming actually involves uh, Christ coming to gain his people at the very beginning, and then he comes down to earth at the very end. There's, there, it makes sense to have the, the coming bookended by both of those. So, Brother Kenneth noted that um, the, in the rapture, Christ does not actually come to earth, but the church rises to meet Christ in the air, and that is that is the case. He does not actually physically arrive down in earth, but he comes, you can still say he comes to earth uh, in a in a sense, and he shows up in the heavens uh, uh, physically and, and bodily. And you could even say that what begins to happen after that is he's coming in judgment. That's not a physical coming, but it's still a coming, a coming in judgment. And yes, Brother Gerard notes that the pre-tribulational view signifies that Christ uh, coming, let's see, doesn't pre-trib signify Christ coming, and so it can't be unexpected if pre-trib is the first event. Um, so the pre-tribulational part is that's the, the, the tribulation is the very first, you know, it's an event that comes before the tribulation, so it's unexpected. The actual coming to earth at the end can't be unexpected because all the tribulation events um, follow after that. Does, does that answer your question, Brother Gerard? Let's see if he if he responds. He says, sort of. <laughs> do you want to clarify? Do you want to ask further for some clarification? Uh, Brother Joel can even unmute you so you can speak.
feel free to jump in at any point. Um, oh, okay. sorry. Oh, go ahead. Yes, jump in. Yes. Uh, if the free trip ha happened, then there will be a chaos in the world because many people will be missing. And so the people should be expecting something to happen. So if you are talking about a very complex event, a process, uh, I think people should be expecting some catastrophe because people are missing really when the pre-trip happened. Yeah, so in a pre-tribulational scheme, um, after that happens, it's very likely that people will know that there is judgment that is coming on the earth. And I think that's actually what we see in Revelation. People actually recognize the wrath of the Lamb has come upon them. Uh, they actually call out for the mountains to come on and hide them from the wrath of the Lamb. Uh, so at that point, people move into a stage where what's happening is, is not completely, I, I would say, um, they, they understand they're in a different time period, that something unusual has begun to happen on the earth, that it's not just, it's not just business as usual. A very good point. Uh, Dr. Arnold also notes that the key thing is that the pre-tribulation is going to distinguish two comings in a sense. Uh, so the rapture is unexpected. Um, it's the rapture part of the coming that has to be unexpected on the pre-tribulational framework. So, so that may help. It's the rapture that's unexpected. The actual return of Christ to earth uh, wouldn't be. Now, the reason why I don't want to call those two comings is, is because the Bible seems to speak of them as a unitary event. I mean, it's an event that unfolds over a seven-year period, but the Bible sees them as a kind of a unitary uh, kind of thing. Very good questions. Very, very good interaction. I'd like to, to move um, very quickly uh, through chapters four and five, and, and, and then move on to chapter six. And, and what we're doing here is I'm trying to get, spend time on things that really orient us to how we should understand the book. Like if we focus in on the prologue, if we focus in on some of these key passages like the Alibet Discourse, uh, these would be the key markers for us. And, and some of these things will fall into place for us, fall into place for you as you do your own study. And so we, don't, we have a limited amount of time, so let's focus in on some of the real key things that will provide us. Uh, that'll orient you. But let's, uh, so chapter six is where I really, really want to get us via the Olivet Discourse, but we'll survey uh, Revelation uh, four and five. I'll note that uh, Daniel seven and Ezekiel one are significant Old Testament background for these chapters. So if you want to study those chapters on your own, you know, if you notice Daniel seven keeps coming up, Daniel seven is a very important uh, passage. People in the first century, even Jews, that were not Christians, understood Daniel 7 was a really important passage, and it shows up. Uh, and of course, for Christians, it's especially an important passage. Background to this as well. Uh, what John does here when he's caught up to heaven in chapter 4 in, in this vision is he enters a heavenly sanctuary. This is like a temple kind of scene. Um, the trumpet voice summons John as like a trumpet that summons Israel to worship at the tabernacle or temple. Uh, in the tabernacle or the temple, there was the Ark of the Covenant, and that symbolized the throne of God. And here, uh, John sees the, 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 the trumpet, or the, 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 the throne, rather, the throne of God, that's the heavenly counterpart uh, to the Ark. So this is a temple scene, and it's a throne room scene, all in one. Around the Ark are 24 thrones, where God's attendants sit, wearing white the elders, they sit wearing white garments and golden crowns. And by the end of the chapter, they're bowing and chanting praise to God. It's, it's a worship service in this heavenly temple. There are seven lamps before the throne, which are reminiscent of the lamps in the temple, 2 Chronicles 4.7. Before the throne is a sea of glass that reminds us of the great bronze sea that was in the tabernacle in the temple court. And these four creatures remind us of the cherubim who are sewn into all the curtains in the tabernacle. Um, they are surrounding the throne, just like in Ezekiel, the throne was supported by the cherubim. And it's the same creature. Ezekiel speaks of the cherubim having four faces, like a lion, an eagle, a man, and a bull. And it's those same, those, those four creatures are all represented here in this heavenly sanctuary. 
Um, John intended to see here, for us to see here, a heavenly throne room uh, temple. And he's going to model for us what true worship is like. I would say that the occurrence of the scene is directly before the Lamb begins to unleash the judgments of uh, the day of the Lord. We should note also this throne shows that God is sovereign over all things. The precious stones together with the rainbow, there's an emerald rainbow that surrounds the throne. It hints that this vision will eventually initiate or result in a new creation. That's what the rainbow reminds us of. I'll spend a little bit of time talking about these elders. Who are the elders? A lot of people argue that the 24 elders are angels. Um, I think that 24 elders are representatives of the redeemed. You have 12 tribes of Israel. You have 12 apostles. That gives you 24. These 24 people, the 24 elders are representatives of the redeemed. The fact that they wear crowns harks back to the dominion mandate of Genesis 28. Casting them before the throne is the opposite of what happened at the fall. Instead of trying to seize the prerogatives of God to be like God in their rule, they take those thrones and they cast them at God's feet in submission to God. There's thunder and lightning in this passage in Revelation uh, 4 and 5. This, this is theophonic imagery, the theophany, the presence of God made manifest. And this, this thunder and lightning is going to show up at the at the seventh seal, the seventh trumpet, and the seventh bowl, showing that the, the, the presence of God and God's wrath is actually coming down on, on the earth. Uh, the, a major part of this is there's a scroll. God the Father is on the throne and he has a scroll. And, and the question is, uh, who is worthy uh, to open the scroll? Now, what's in that scroll? There's, there's speculation about that. But what we do know is that when that when the Lamb unseals that scroll, seal by seal, what, what comes on the earth is judgment. It may be that that scroll is, is, the, is, the, is the commission or the title deed to the earth. You know, this is, this is the right to rule that the Ancient of Days in Daniel 7 gave to the Son of Man. Here's the right to rule. And that rule begins at, at first to, to uh, manifest itself. In terms of judgment. Now, one of the great things that distresses John is there is no one worthy to open that scroll. There's the inability of any of God's creatures to execute God's plan of redemption, especially God's judgment on the earth, until he sees that the lion of the tribe of Judah, which is an allusion to Genesis 49 9, and the root of David, an allusion to Isaiah 11 1 is the one who is worthy to open the seal. But when, when John actually turns to see who is, is the one who's going to take the seal, what he sees is not the lion, but what he sees is the lamb. He sees a lamb standing as though it had been slain. This refers to, to Christ and his sacrificial death on the cross. Christ who comes back as the judge is worthy to judge the world because he is the one that actually already bore the judgment of God in our place. Uh, he is a lamb with seven horns. And that's, those seven horns refer to his strength. He is the omnipotent, all-powerful judge who comes to judge the world. He is the one with seven eyes, which refers to his omniscience. Of course, it also refers to the spirit. He is empowered by the spirit, even in this judgment. So this is a this is quite a quite a vision of who it is. It's the Lord Himself, it's Christ Himself, the, the 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 slain but powerful, omnipotent, omniscient Christ who will judge. And when He comes forward to take that scroll, there's a hymn that is sung, and the hymn makes explicit the main point of the vision, the main point of these chapters. God is to be glorified because of His holiness and His sovereignty. Worthy are you to take the scroll to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people from every tribe and language and people and nation, and have made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. That really is a culmination of what the whole Bible is all about. 
that the lamb is worthy because of what he did to work out redemption. And what is he doing? He's redeeming people from every, every people group, every ethnicity, every language group. He's redeeming them all. Uh, people from all of those things, all of those categories. And he's making them fulfill his original purpose for them, to be kings and priests, to be a kingdom and priests to God, and to reign on the earth. And he is praised for that. And the one of the lamb is, is, is given blessing and honor and glory. The, the, the chief end of man is to give God glory, and that's what we see happening uh, here. And that brings us to chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 1. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come. And then we get these seal judgments that unfold. And what's happening in these seal judgments is uh, our, our illusions, especially these first four seal judgments, they're illusions to the Olivet Discourse. And so if we're going to understand chapter 6, and I think we need to understand chapter 6 to understand the trumpet judgments and the bold judgments. So if we're going to understand chapter 6, we need to understand the Olivet Discourse. Uh, so that's what we'll turn to now, I'm moving to that place in my notes. And I'm actually going to pull up the text in uh, parallel. Um, on the screen that I'll share. Yes, yeah, so there's highlights there. And let me share it with the people on Zoom. Okay, so let me explain what you're seeing here. Oh, I need to actually click one more button for it to actually share for the Zoom people. There we go. Okay, so what you see here is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and I've color-coded it. So what's in red is stuff that's unique to Matthew. Uh, what is in, I think green is unique, no? What's in yellow there is unique to Mark. And what is blue is unique to Luke. What is orange shows up in Matthew and Mark. What is green shows up in Mark and Luke. What is purple shows up in Luke and Matthew. And what is gray shows up in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now I'm not gonna, when I, went, when I studied this, I actually paid careful attention to all those things. And we're not gonna have time for me to talk through all of what is what, but I just wanted to explain that to you. So when you're looking at that, you know what those, what those colors all stand for. Now, when, we're, when we are in the Olivet Discourse, um, there's four ways that people have commonly understood the Olivet Discourse. So we're going to talk through these four different uh, interpretive approaches to the Olivet Discourse. Some people limit the reference of Jesus' teaching. That means, what is Jesus talking about here? They limit what Jesus is talking about in the Olivet Discourse exclusively to the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. So they say everything that happens that Jesus is talking about here is about the fall of Jerusalem, the fall of the temple, back in AD 70, back in the first century. Or some people say it was, it's almost all AD 70, but after, say, Matthew 24, 36 and Mark 13, 32, there is the return of Christ to earth. So you, you kind of like it's 80, 70, then you leap forward to the return of Christ, and, and, you, get, and you get that. Now, this, the validity of this view hangs on in an interpretation of Matthew 24, 29 and its parallels, where the coming of Jesus in the clouds of heaven isn't his return to earth, as we've already talked about. It's referring to Daniel chapter 7, and we've said Daniel chapter 7, that return to the clouds of heaven is eschatological, it's last days. Well, these people say, Jesus returned in the clouds of heaven in AD 70 when the temple fell. Now, he wasn't visible. Nobody saw him. But, but that judgment on Jerusalem is what fills that. And we're going to see that that's not really a very good interpretation. At the opposite extreme, there are interpreters who hold the discourse is entirely eschatological. It's only about things that are in the future that have never happened yet. Uh, Adolf Schlatter and Theodore Zahn, two uh, interpreters in the late 19th century, early 20th century, uh, they held this view. 
But I think it's really difficult to exclude the destruction of the temple in AD 70 from the discourse because it was Jesus' statements about the destruction of the temple that actually begins the discourse. So it's really hard to exclude the destruction of the temple in AD 70 uh, from the discourse. Now, a common view, this is probably the most common view. Well, maybe I could say it's the most common view in evangelical commentaries today, although that explicitly 8070 view is also very common. But the common view, very common view, is that the discourse is historical. It refers to events from 8070 and then in the entire era from the destruction of Jerusalem to the return of Christ. So we're, it covers time that we're still in today. So from 8070 all the way through the present until Christ actually returns, and then also the return of Christ. All of that is taken up in the discourse. Now these interpreters, they differ. Where do you draw the line between what's historical and the stuff that's still to come? There's, there's disagreement about that. This view does go all the way back to the church fathers. The, there's an anonymous author, a uh, church father, who wrote an incomplete commentary on Matthew, and he said he knew of an interpreter who divided the sermon at the abomination of desolation. So everything before the abomination of desolation is some, you know, either around AD 70 or going through the church age, but abomination of desolation, now you've jumped to the future. Um, the reformer John Calvin, he took this view, he divided it a little bit differently. Um, D.A. Carson, Craig Blomberg, they're two modern commentators, they both take this view and they divide it again a little differently. I think this approach is better than saying it's all 8070 or it's all future. But I think it does have a couple of problems. First, there's a lack of agreement as to what's historical and what's future. And the fact that people can't really agree about that, I think, casts some doubt on the rightness of this approach. Second, this approach renders the discourse somewhat confused. Like sometimes Jesus is talking about questions about the temple destruction, and then other times he's talking about his return at the end of the age. And with some of these things, he's kind of moving back and forth between these things, and he's not really consistent about what he's talking about uh, when. Uh, for Carson and Blomberg, the discussion begins with general remarks about the church age, and then it abruptly returns to the to the abomination of desolation, which they take to be something that happens in AD 70. And then it rockets forward to the second coming. And you'll see you're, you're kind of moving all around here. Third, I think these interpretations neglect connections to the Old Testament passages. The Old Testament passages that Jesus is referring to puts all this in the day of the Lord framework. And so I, I think that uh, that, the, that this interpretation doesn't really pay attention enough to the Old Testament. Now, there is a fourth approach, and this is the approach that I like. This approach also reaches back as early into the early church. Augustine seems to have taken this view. Uh, the patristic author of the incomplete commentary of Matthew, he describes the view as follows. The Lord does not say distinctly which signs pertain to the destruction of Jerusalem and which to the end of the world, namely, so that the same signs seem to pertain to both the manifestation of the destruction of Jerusalem and to the manifestation of the end of the world, because he did not explain them distinctly. In fact, they, they, they actually both refer to the same thing, but in a prophetic manner, he predicted them to the things that were to be done. Okay, let me let me say that a little more clearly. The events that Jesus is talking about apply to both the destruction in AD 70 and to the eschatological day of the Lord at the same time. The day of the Lord, in the AD 70 event was the day of the Lord. It was a judgment. And it was a type that anticipated the future judgment when Christ returns. So, so it's like, it's like these Old Testament passages we have where the prophet is speaking and he's melded, like, like Dr. Arnold was talking today, the, the, the Old Testament passages, they, they sometimes merge distinct events into the same prophecy. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing here. He's, he's telescoped together, he's merged together the same events, or, or different events into the same prophecy. And so when he's talking, say, well, 
we'll get into some of the details later. But but as we go through, we look at some of these events, we say, okay, I see how this was fulfilled in 8070 in kind of a lesser fashion and in a greater fashion, it's going to be finally and ultimately fulfilled in the ultimate final day of the Lord. This view has commended itself to other interpreters uh, really throughout the ages. So in the Middle Ages, Thomas Aquinas notes it in his commentary in Matthew. Jonathan Edwards held this view. He said, in this chapter, respect is had especially to two events. One, the destruction of Jerusalem and the works of God that accompanied it. The other, the end of the world. And some things are most applicable to one, and others to another, as is common in those parts of Scripture that have respect to various events. Again, he's pointing back to the prophets. He says, just like the Old Testament prophets talked about different events and they merged them into the same prophecy, that's what's going on here. This was also the view of the 19th century Baptist commentator, John Broadus. Broadus says, every attempt to assign a definite point of division between the two topics has proved a failure. In other words, he's talking about the view that some of it's historical and some of it's eschatological. He says, you place the division after verse 28, saying that up to that point, only the historical stuff is meant. And after that point, only the eschatological stuff is meant. And at once we see verse 34 has to refer to the destruction of Jerusalem. So we say, okay, well, after verse 34. Well, what about verses 36 and 24? Those need to refer to the, you know, so you can't, you can't neatly divide it, he's saying. But if the destruction of Jerusalem was itself, in one sense, the coming of the Lord, why may we not suppose that the transition from this to the final coming is gradual? That they're talking really about both the same thing. The English expositor Henry Elford agreed. He says, it must be borne in mind the whole is spoken in the pregnant language of prophecy in which the various fulfillments are involved. The destruction of Jerusalem and the final judgments are both enwrapped together in the words. Uh, Dutch theologians, Gerhardus Voss, Herman Ritterboss, Anthony Heckema, they also take this view. Voss says, if the answer of the Savior, a sharp division is not made between what belongs to one and what belongs to the other, it's very difficult for us to make the division. And Hekema observed, as we read the discourse, however, we find that aspects of these two topics are intermingled. Matters concerning the destruction of Jerusalem, epitomized by the destruction of the temple, are mingled together with matters that concern the end of the world. So much so, it is sometimes hard to determine whether Jesus is referring to the one or the other, or perhaps to both. Obviously, the method of teaching used here by Jesus is that of prophetic foreshortening, in which events far removed in time and events in the near future are spoken of as if they were close together. And the dispensationalist interpreter, Craig Blazing, defends this approach by noting that Jesus, in this very discourse, said that he did not know the day or the hour of his return. Thus, Jesus, by his own admission, does not know whether the 8070 destruction and the second coming will be one and the same or two different events. In Matthew 24, 4 through 35, Jesus sets out the pattern that links Daniel's time of the end, Daniel 2, Daniel 7, with the day of the Lord. The whole pattern is the second coming. Remember, the second coming is a complex multi-year event. However, just as was the case in the Old Testament, it is possible for a type of the eschatological day of the Lord to appear in history in advance of the anti-type. So a type is like a pattern. And the pattern occurs in history before the final event, the anti-type occurs. And that's what we have. We have a day of the Lord in 8070. That's the type. We have the final ultimate day of the Lord, the ultimate coming of Christ at the end of time. That is the anti-type. Blazing says, in the case of the Olivet Discourse, the narrative structure, which itself is a synthesis of prophetic patterns, it synthesizes the day of the Lord, Daniel's time of the end, Daniel 2, Daniel 7. It references both the 8070 destruction and the future second coming with language that may be wholly applicable to one, wholly applicable to another, or equally applicable to both at the same time. So that's the, that latter view is the view that we're going to, to uh, try to unpack here. We're going to unpack this in detail and defend it in detail. But any questions, not on the details of how this might work out, because that's what we're going to go to next, but any questions about what these four views are? Were these four views, are, do you understand clearly 
uh, what the four views are, especially this fourth one that we're going to be talking about. Any questions about that? Okay, well let's move let's move into the into the exposition of the of the text then. Uh, we'll, we'll start with Matthew 24, 1 through 3. And I'll uh, I'll read that. I'll just read it off of here. Um, you, you can see up there uh, what it looks like in terms of uh, what the parallels are. But I think it'll be easier if I just read it here. So Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, you see all these things, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be one left here. There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And I'm just looking here to see uh, if there's any major differences between the three passages that I want to highlight. They're fairly similar. So when Jesus left the temple, and this is the time he left the temple for the last time in his earthly ministry, uh, he may have been indicating that this was actually judgment. He's leaving the temple in judgment. In Ezekiel 10, Yahweh left the temple in judgment on the people for their sins. And so now the Messiah is leaving the temple for the last time. He, you know, he had to cleanse it during this, you know, there was opposition. And all three Gospels note that Jesus had pronounced judgment on the Jewish leaders just prior to this leaving. So this, this judgment aspect of his departure may have been evident to the disciples. In fact, in Matthew 23, 38, right before this passage, Matthew records that Jesus has specifically proclaimed, your house, which was in the temple, your house is left you desolate. So I really do think there's a judgment involved in Jesus' leaving of the temple here. Now the disciples, as they're going away, they're pointing out to him the buildings of the temple. Um, they're praising uh, the buildings of the temple. And Jesus, uh, they may be, in doing that, they may be wishing Jesus to actually affirm the splendor of the temple. Here they can sense there's judgment here, but they want Jesus to affirm the temple's splendor, a visible sign of God's presence. And I think at the very least, their response shows them to be out of step with Jesus' viewpoint of the temple. Jesus responds to their praise of the temple by predicting there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And this statement provokes questions from the disciples. All three Gospels record the disciples asking, when will these things be? Matthew 24, 3, Mark 13, 4, Luke 21, 7. They were clearly asking Jesus when the temple destruction he spoke of would take place. Now, Matthew pairs this question, when will these things be, with another given in two parts. And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So here, by asking these questions, the disciples, they link the destruction of the temple with an eschatological advent of Christ, with Christ's second coming. And the same thing occurs in Mark, although it's not as clear, Mark, but, but you should be attuned to this because of what we talked about earlier. In Mark, they, what we are, what's recorded, what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? That's that same phrase that's picked up in Daniel. I, actually, no, I'm sorry. This is a little different. This is not Daniel 2 that we looked at before. When all these things are about to be accomplished actually alludes to Daniel chapter 12, verses 6 through 7. Daniel 12, 6 through 7 refers to a, quote, time of trouble for Israel, quote, such as has never been since there was a nation till that time. Daniel 12, 1. So Mark alludes back to this time, to this, uh, this passage in Daniel that refers to a great time of tribulation, a great time of trouble. In the course of the vision in Daniel 12, someone says, how long shall it be till the end of these wonders? End and accomplished is the same word in Greek. And the response is that it would be for a time, times, and half a time, and that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to end, all these things would be finished. And that's all these things are to be accomplished. All these things would be finished. 
That's again in Greek a parallel between Mark 13 and Daniel 12 there. Now when Daniel inquired further, he was told that the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. But as Jesus is leaving the temple, the disciples asked Jesus, what will be the sign that these things are about to take place? And the plural things indicate more than just the temple. It may indicate that Luke is focused on, um, um, I'm sorry, I skipped from, from, uh, from Mark there to Luke. Um, let, me, let me wrap up Mark. Mark is, is telling us here that these things are connected to the time of the end. So we have the temple and the time of the end in view. In Luke, the disciples asked Jesus, and what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And the plural of things may indicate more than just the temple. Although it may indic just indicate that Luke is more focused on the temple destruction in his account of the discourse, which I think is the case. When the Gospels are compared, I think Luke focuses the reader's attention on the typological fulfillment in AD 70. So Luke is focused on the destruction of the temple in AD 70. I think Matthew is focused on the anti-typical fulfillment the end time fulfillment, and Mark is kind of in the middle. I think clearly the disciples, they link the destruction of the temple and the Son of Man's coming to the end of the age. They expected these things to happen as a single event. And Jesus, who in this discourse states he doesn't know the timing of these events, and thus whether or by how much they're separated, he actually treats them together. And I think it was appropriate for him to link the two events. The events accompanying the judgments on the guilty city will be the foreshadowing of the final judgment in his second advent. And I think this is fitting because the temple is a microcosm of the cosmos. The judgment on the one symbolizes the judgment on the other. Any questions on this, on this portion here? We have another very short portion that I think we can get through. And that is Matthew 24, uh, 4 through 8, and it's parallels. Uh, Jesus answered them, see that no one leads you, this is his answer to the, that, those questions that we just talked about, see that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am in the Christ, uh, the, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise up against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of birth pangs. The beginning of birth pangs here, this is what Revelation 6 is all about. Now I think these verses were clearly fulfilled typologically in AD 70, in the years between Christ's ascension and the destruction of the temple. And many commentators document these historical fulfillments. For instance, it says that there will be uh, many that will come and say, I am the Christ. And there were various people that pretended to be the, mess the Messiah during this time. Acts 5 notes a man named Thutius who uh, rose up. And Josephus mentions him and many other people that claim to be Messiahs in this time period. The war between Israel against Rome, which began in AD 66 and AD 67, it was preceded by growing hostility that the zealots had incited. Uh, so there's wars, rumors of wars. There's famine. There's famine that ravaged Judea. Acts 11, 27 through 30 talks about this. And they, you can date this to AD 45 to 47. Josephus also mentions this. Uh, we know that there was an earthquake that shook Laodicea in AD 60 and 61. We know there was an earthquake in Pompeii in AD 62. Acts 1660. Acts 1626 also mentions an earthquake. So all these things that are mentioned here in verses 4 through 8, we actually have documentation either in the Bible or in um, other literature like Josephus and oftentimes in both of them that show these things were happening in the first century, in the 8060s leading up to AD, AD 70. However, as is common, when the type is followed by the anti-type, the type only foreshadows what is a fuller fulfillment. So one commentator notes that Jesus actually said the people would say, I am the Christ, actually claiming to be Jesus Christ, not just generally to be the Messiah. And nobody did that in 8070 or the years just before that. We don't have any possession, a record of any false messiahs um, actually claiming to be Jesus himself. 
And some of these people claimed to be rulers or were leading people, but weren't always claiming to be a messiah. So the first century is, is actually pointing towards a fuller future a fulfillment when actually the Antichrist will come and actually claim to be the messiah. Many interpreters understand these verses to, to, to describe the entire period between AD 70 and the present, uh, or, or even the, the, the coming of Christ. Uh, even people who sometimes see the rest of the discourse referring to the future, they see these verses as referring to the entire period uh, between Christ's two comings. And what they're, what they're picking up on is the phrase, but the end is not yet, or the end is not immediately. Matthew 24, 6 in parallels. Uh, you know, I, I should scroll, I should scroll this down so that you can see the parallels here. Yeah, right there. Um, so for instance, Craig Blomberg, he proposes well, he, he just says that this section, they can't be the day of the Lord, the end, the eschatological day of the Lord, because it says the end is, uh, is not yet. However, I think it's best to understand these verses as referring typologically to the first century and ultimately to the ultimate day of the Lord. And in terms of the type, what is the end in view? The end in view is the destruction of the temple. All of these things happened in the 8060s, and the end wasn't yet. The temple wasn't destroyed yet regarding the anti-type the end must be taken as the end of the messianic birth things the, the end is actually the return of jesus christ to earth and remember this takes place over a period of, of, of a number of years so at the beginning of these of, of the day of the lord these are things at the beginning of the day of the lord the end of the day of the lord is not yet your hardest boss says as an infant cannot be born without pains, so too the rebirth of the entire earthly creation, which coincides with the end, will occur under terrible labor pains. The beginning of those pains consists of wars, sicknesses, famines, and earthquakes. In itself, all of this would not be, yet be something special. But Luke 21.11 tells us that this will be accompanied by terrible things and great signs from heaven, thus by something extraordinary so that it will be easy to distinguish them from ordinary disasters and distresses. I don't think these are the ordinary, people will understand, this is a great distress at the final end of the age. Also, I think it's significant that Paul alludes to the birth pangs of the Olivet Discourse in 1 Thessalonians 5.3. So in 1 Thessalonians 5.3, Paul says, uh, while people are saying there's peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. And I think Paul is actually alluding back here to the Olivet Discord. And he's interpreting these verses as referring ultimately to the final day of the Lord. And I think this distinction between the initial birth things and the end reveals that the day of the Lord is not an instantaneous uh, event that you know, Christ returns to earth, and that's it. That's the day of the Lord. Instead, these verses are indicating that there's going to be an eschatological tribulation that extends over time. I think the commentator Luz captures the meaning of the section of the discourse well. When acknowledging the first century applicability, he states, Thus begin the pangs, that is the tribulations of the last days. Thus, all of that is not yet the end, but it does deal with the beginnings. Of the end. I think, I think that's what these uh, first four, or, or, or verses four through eight in Matthew 24 and the parallels are dealing with. And that brings us right to 10 o'clock, um, but I'm happy to stay here for questions, both on Zoom and if anybody has questions here in the room. But if I understand it's 10 o'clock, it's late, feel free to slip out and, as well. But I'm any other questions that people would have, uh, I'm very open. Uh, to answer those as well. We'll pick up with this uh, tomorrow, so you'll have further opportunity to ask questions about the Olivet Discourse uh, tomorrow as well. Okay, I'm not seeing any uh, any questions, so I don't want I don't want to detain anybody here uh, either. 
So thank you very much for, for the good uh, interaction today.